I'm thinking something like. <laughs> Later. <laughs> we'll do it on Wednesday. We'll remember. Will we? I don't know. <laughs> Hi, Amber. Hi, sweet angel of my life. Ooh, I love it. <laughs> I had so much fun today. I drove in from Pittsburgh and I was like, good God, what have I done? <laughs> You're like, I'm, I'm going to be there. <laughs> I was like, how do I say this in a nice way that I am not at 100? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but it was, as always, so much fun and mm-hmm. brought my stress levels down. Yeah. I, know I had some heavy sessions today and, um, Somebody else asked me, like, how are you doing? I was like, good, hard day, but I get to record the podcast. Oh, I was like, I'm tired, but that is going to be some lighthearted stuff. So, yeah. Isn't it funny that we're, I mean, this podcast is lighthearted. It's not Mm -hmm. like. Even though we talk about stuff. Right. But you texted and you were like, oh, it'll be good to have some lighthearted. I'm like, it's awesome that it's therapy comedy podcast, but like Mm -hmm. therapy's involved and we still feel it's light. We always laugh a lot. I think it's really good for your nervous system. Like when like you know when you're like crying about something and then Mm. that's like really sad or hard and then you end up laughing at something (laughs) like when clients do that or because darcy responds to tears and Mm. and sadness and so darcy will come up and put a paw and they start laughing i'll say notice what it feels like for you to be laughing and and you're it's rewiring so this i feel like this just helps our nervous systems when we get to do this (laughs) oh just when you get to laugh and hear at the same time yeah i love i want to say Praise God right now. <laughs> what has gotten into you today? You got the spirit. In <laughs> yeah. I, listen, I'm sleepy, but also like I, I want to. I, I, so I had a God conversation uh, with someone in Pittsburgh and he's like former Christian, kind of still Christian. And he was like, what are your thoughts? And I was like, well, I believe we're all God. And I'm wearing a tie up shirt. And I talk about, he was like, do you do mushrooms? And I was like, yeah. And he was like, yeah. <laughs> You're wearing tie dye. You have no we're bra. All God we're all God. He's like, yeah, you're sounding pretty typical right now. Have I'm you like, heard Good. the "We're all God and drag"? <laughs> no. You that, have it? No. I think Ramdas says it. We're all just God and drag walking oh. around. Like we're all the same thing. It's just our body separating us. So we're God and drag. I love that. Mm-hmm. I love Ramdas. Mm-hmm. Oh my God. Me too. Um. So today our our guest was so great. Love him too. Oh mm-hmm. my goodness. His name's Derek Humphrey. Super. Just chill, kind, good energy. Yes. Loved and it. like you said in the podcast, very aware. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Even in his like, yeah, that's probably something I should check out. I don't know. You know? <laughs> yeah. Um, I'm always so great. He was like, he says he's, he opened up more than he thought he did. He would. Mm-hmm. And I'm just so grateful like, when yes. that happened. I know. <laughs> oh, it's the best. So grateful. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. I think y'all enjoy it a lot. Most definitely. Mm-hmm. We love y'all. Thanks for listening. Thank you. Thank you if you're a subscriber. Extra love. Extra <laughs> if you subscribe. <laughs> yes. But still a moi moi. To everybody. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Enjoy the episode. Thanks. <laughs> <laughs> Hello. 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 <laughs> Yo, Darcy is already like loving you. Mm-hmm. Oh, that's good. Are you a doggy person? I, I am a doggy person. I was waiting uh, to start the pod, but yeah. Um, we actually, uh, our dog just passed away. No. Mm. And so uh, it's been a, it's been a rough um, three and a half weeks now. Yeah. Uh, so I'm happy to. To have a dog here. Oh. Yeah. No How long had you had your... What's your pup's name? Uh, her name is Henrietta. Oh. <laughs> yeah, she was a little um, bulldog. Wait, Aww. I saw her in your bio. That's one of your hobbies. Yeah. Yeah, oh. <laughs> yeah she's my little girl. And uh, my wife and I do not have children. And mm. um, so we treated yeah. her... I mean, we would have... Tre- regardless, if we had kids. We would have treated her mm-hmm. uh, the best. But um, she was my best friend. I mean, because, like, I primarily spent a lot of time alone, and Mm -hmm. it was just me and her. Yeah. And um, she was, like, kind of a constant reminder of, like, oh, there's innocence and sweetness in the world and unconditional love and all that sort of stuff. And despite everything going on, all the craziness in the world, I I had my little girl who... Mm -hmm. 
even when my wife was mad at me, she wasn't. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, uh, yeah. yeah, so we lost her. And um, it's been, you know, I, I'm, my wife has, to be frank, um, she'll cop to it. She, she's she's taking it really pretty hard. I have, too. Like, I cried more about losing my dog than I did my dad. I yeah. mean, which says more about my relationship with my father, <laughs> I think. But also how much I love my dog. Yeah. And I've been, like, my wife has been having, like, a day on will be, you know, it'll be full on. Like, she's really upset, you know, in the throes of it. And the next day she'll be fine. And then, or at least managing it. Mm -hmm. And then I'll try to, like, um, put on the good face, you know, be the happy-go-lucky guy that Mm -hmm. she married and try and take her mind Mm -hmm. off of it. And then yesterday was the first day that we had been apart since our dog passed when I got in the car to drive here to Nashville. And I got in the car and I was like maybe 15 minutes away from the house. And I just broke down and started crying. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Thinking about my dog and how much like I miss my dog. That know? was the first time you'd cried? No, 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 no. I cried. I, you know, um, <clears throat> I cry like almost every day thinking about her. It's okay. usually first thing in the morning. It's like I wake up because my <laughs> my response always first thing in the, the morning was to wake up and touch my dog. Mm-hmm. And um, she had a big old belly, mm-hmm. and um, and even when I get up go to the bathroom in the middle of the night, I put my hand on her stomach to make sure she was still breathing because oh. I was just like always concerned because we almost lost her a year and a half ago. Mm-hmm. She had to go to an emergency vet and um, go through rehab and all this stuff, and like we thought we lost her then. So like the last year and a half had been touch and go, mm-hmm. and uh, she was thirteen, which for a bulldog wow. is an old age. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah, so um, so like, I I'll, I still find myself in these things where I'm like, I wake up or I come home late at night, and I'm like, oh, I can't wait to see my, oh, damn. God damn it, yeah, 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 it's a heartbreaker, mm-hmm. you know. So, so yeah, so Darcy's great. Oh, that's <laughs> it's so- great to see her. She has big brown eyes like my little girl did. Mm-hmm. So yeah. that's so major, dude. Like, I mean. It's hard for anybody to lose a pup, but like as a, you were talking about you're alone a lot. Like being a comedian is such a solo thing. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. My, my wife works during the day. She's a teacher. And then um, I'm, I'm alone all day during the day, either doing admin stuff or like I have side hustles and stuff like that. And, mm-hmm. um, and she was just there for me. And she was also like, I, I didn't realize until she was gone how much um, I connected with other people in my neighborhood. Oh, wow. <laughs> so I live in Queens and um, uh, like we have a park like right across the street from our place. And I mm-hmm. take her out every morning and we walk and talk to the neighbors and like all the people liked her. <laughs> They'd like all gather around her and pet her and. She was like a little neighborhood superstar, and that's how <laughs> I like got to talking to other people. <laughs> yeah, and so like I noticed like the first couple of days, like I'm like, oh, I don't talk to my neighbors. <laughs> like I don't see them now because like she was my connection to it. Wow. Yeah. So it was it, it's it's been a real adjustment for sure. Yeah. And she was part of our lives for 13 years. I mean, my wife and I have been together for 12, 12 and a half, something like that. So my wife had her first, but like I came along when she was a puppy still. Yeah. Oh my goodness. And she was just integral to our lives, you know, and mm-hmm. we kind of crafted our whole schedule around her. Like for the past couple of summers, my wife's been going on separate vacations from me because like <laughs> she was so... <laughs> Well, I know it sounds crazy to some people, but she was so like, our dog was like, so the fragile, you know, her health was so touch and go that we didn't want to leave her with just anybody. Yeah. Mm. And so if we did, it would be like a really close friend. Or I had my parents fly to New York <laughs> to like stay with our dog for a week oh. so we could go to Costa Rica together. We could actually take a vacation. And um, we don't, we didn't want anybody like, you know, screwing up her health or anything. She had mm-hmm. a strict diet, you know. If we if we'd leave her with some of my family members, she'd just eat nothing but hot dogs. <laughs> and so Henrietta's like, Yeah, that one. Yeah, I know. Henrietta was all about it, but not not me. I was no, we, she's she's vegetarian, whether she likes it no, or not. No, oh, a yeah. vegetarian bulldog? Vegetarian bulldog. Because everything would make her, she had real bad stomach allergies. Everything oh, would make her honey. sick. So it's like, we're not taking the risk. Yeah. Uh-huh. So every now and again, I'd sneak her a little piece of meat. But um, <laughs> have you and your wife had a moment to just like cry together? Oh yeah, yeah, mm-hmm. that's nice. Yeah, um, 
Yeah, and a lot too. And I mean the how it came together, like how she passed was really traumatic. And we we I mean that day was the worst day I've had in a long time. Yeah. You know? And so the first few days afterwards, I feel like that's kind of all we did, mm-hmm. you know? And, uh, you know, it's, it's, uh, I might do it now, but it's just been, it's, okay. uh, it, it's just been tough. Um, you know, and, and we're trying our best to be supportive of each other. Yeah. It seems like y'all, you tend to do that. I know in my relationship, like we take turns, like one is the calm steady, like it's okay. It's going to be okay. Well, the other one freaks out and then you kind of take turns so you yeah. can each have those moments where you just need to feel what you're feeling. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. Even though inside you're like, yeah, uh-huh. I feel the same that you do. Oh yeah, for sure. <laughs> and honestly, and like for, uh, up until our, our dog got, you know, was starting to get really pretty bad. Like most of the things that we would freak out about or have like bad days about were like professionally. Mm-hmm. So my wife is, um, she's highly educated. She does a really great job. She teaches at a very prestigious school. It's a difficult job. A lot of like high pressure to it. And she wants to move up. She's getting her doctorate and wow. all that sort of stuff. And, you know, being a comedian, you're like, I want more. I don't even like more. It's just like. <laughs> I, no, I get it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I just, I just want to work and like ply my craft or whatever. Mm-hmm. And like, you know, just, just feel like I'm doing the thing that I love to do. And like when opportunities don't arise or you miss out on one and like. Like, like the morning that like my dog passed, I got really mad because I had a, a weekend get canceled on me. And I was like, and it was like the third or fourth time from this one particular booker. And I was like, I called her. I was like, this guy doesn't respect me. I don't know if I can swear. This guy doesn't you respect can, me. Yeah, okay. yeah. <laughs> this guy doesn't fucking respect me. I'm so tired of not being respected in this business. And then yeah. like, and then you realize after something like that happens with your family and your dog, you're like, oh, I'm worried about the dumbest shit. Mm. And it puts it into perspective mm-hmm. and like, yeah. if anything, I, it's made me more chill about stuff, you know, I, I would like to think, <laughs> but, um, you know, it still bubbles up Yeah, every now and again. Yeah. And mm-hmm. like, how has it been being funny? I mean, I feel like a lot of comedians go sick. They go sad. They, you know, like, you can't not do comedy. But yeah. What's it been like? Yeah. I will say the first, um, so my dog passed on a Thursday. And I had that weekend, I didn't want to leave my wife alone. Yeah. And so I just had spots around the city. It wasn't really that big of a deal. I wasn't going to lose any like standing or any real money with like my, with bookers or my mm-hmm. peers. And I just explained it to him like, Hey, look, my dog died. I'm really pretty bummed out. Mm-hmm. And then like that first Monday afterwards, I went and did a show and I just kind of went through the motions of it. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And then that following and then the wednesday after i was headlining it was whatever in uh middle pennsylvania and i like had to really set everything aside because like to do that much time Mm -hmm. you can't just really kind of go through the motions of it but it did help it was finally like kind of like therapeutic to be like okay life's gonna go on Mm. you know and um and I do enjoy this and like you, you kind of silly, uh, silly, you kind of like <laughs> goofily think like yeah, my dog would want me to be happy. Of course. Yeah. I don't think that's goofy at all. No, no, I know. I mean like it's, it's hard to, it's, it's, it's hard to like, I find, I always find myself like, uh, uh, kind of like, pushing my emotions onto the dog like, <laughs> like if, they're great like, for that yeah like if henrietta would like look at me funny i'd be like i must be doing something wrong <laughs> you're feeling you're feeling like i'm an idiot too aren't you because you're looking at me this way and she's just probably just like i want treats yeah 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 oh 100 she's like i want food dude <laughs> and i'm like no you think less of me <laughs> And so I would think that, oh. like, you know, I remember I told this to, um, <laughs> uh, I told, I told this to our therapist, my wife and I's therapist that like, um, one time I was really sad about something. I, I forget what it was. It was something, I, I don't even know if it was even important, but I laid down on my bed with my dog and I was like hmm. very upset. And she like was just laying there and she just opened up her eyes just looked at me and just like gave me the look and just started like pawing at me, you know, like, you know, cause animals are sentient in mm-hmm. that regard and they're consciously aware of like, mm-hmm. you know, people's yeah. feelings and mm-hmm. 
and stuff like that. So I've been going down like a TikTok rabbit hole, like you know, you know, reinforcing that notion of seeing like animals reacting to humans and stuff like yeah, that. You know, that's so. nice. Yeah, it's been yeah. comforting for sure. You know, Melanie, you had a uh, a psychic come right after your dog passed. No, I talked to her the day before um, oh when she God. was sick. Mm. Um, I called her because. I, when I had a German Shepherd dog as well um, that died in March. Oh, I'm sorry. Um, to hear that. Yeah, thank you. Um, but I called a psychic um, when she, the vet was like, this is going to happen soon. You probably need to call like the in home, like, yeah. you know, vet to come. And so I just, I don't know. I just needed peace of helping to stop, make that decision. And so I called a psychic, <laughs> like a pet psychic. <laughs> right, right. Did, did, was that helpful for you? It was. And, uh, you know, I just, no, to me, no matter what, if you, whatever you believe around that, like if mm-hmm. whatever you need to help make that, because it's such an emotional decision that feels impossible to make, just left like yeah. on your own. It's just me and my dogs or like my kids. Right. And it's like I would just sell my organs to let them live another day. And I know that's not logical, but when you're in those moments, having Absolutely. to make those calls, like logic isn't a part of it really. Oh, yeah. And so that helped me just having that phone call of just like, she's, she's been in pain for a long time and she's ready. Um, I was wanting to wait a little longer and mm. you know, <laughs> yeah. No, but that for was sure. for me. Um, so it helped me feel like, just that the time was there. Right? Yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. It's it's tough to go through that. And yeah. We, I don't think we were emotionally prepared to make that call. And mm-hmm. we we thought that it was going to, we were, we thought we were kind of extending our life a little bit by taking her to the, the vet. And uh, that wasn't the case. And so, you know, you're never really prepared for it. Mm-hmm. And, um you know, we have a lot of regrets surrounding it and we're working through it. Um, mm. The thing that and no amount of logic will mm-hmm. ever trump like the emotion of it mm-hmm. in that regard. I mean, it can if you get enough time away from it. But we I mean, we provided a lot for her to live so long. And, you know, bulldogs are notorious for having a lot of um, allergies and, and mm-hmm. medical conditions. And she she did not because we just treated it all mm-hmm. right away. Wow. And you know, made sure that she had like a, a really happy life. I just like that Darcy just looking at me. <laughs> but um, yeah, so, you know, it, we are, I, you know, we joke about it. We're like, you know, we would trade anything mm-hmm. uh, to have her back. Like, you know, uh, my wife never really, especially over the last few years, has never really been able to travel with me for comedy. Wow. And because of our dog, you uh-huh. know, we, we'd stay in like, you know, we, we have her on a routine and that was the thing that was keeping her going. So we didn't want to disrupt that. And now, you know, it's like she can travel with me more and mm. and we're enjoying that. But we both are just like we're we sit in the car driving half home after a gig and it's mm-hmm. like we'll be going over notes about the show or whatever. And we're like, this is great. But we would trade it. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. I would be solo and she would be at home, but mm-hmm. we would at least still have our little girl. Yeah, you know, so. they sound like really mm-hmm. good parents. Mm-hmm. Ah, thank you. Yeah. yeah, we um, uh, yeah, it'll be a long time before we go through this again. That's for sure. Mm-hmm. Yes. Yeah, yeah. We, uh, you know, but some of my friends that were like, kind of like, well, you gotta get another dog. It's like, no. oh my god. <laughs> Well, because people there are, say that to you a lot. Yeah. Like, when are you getting another one? You just need another one. I'm like, yeah. Uh, well, they're avoiding the their own feelings. Yeah. I feel like yeah. surrounding mm-hmm. it, you know. And and um, I'm from Ohio, <laughs> and a lot of a lot of people I grew up around are very like stoic, unemotional people. Mm-hmm. And I have been too. I mean, I've I've been through a lot of my life that's made me not necessarily always the most emotional person, but like something like this, I'm like, you got to be able to empathize a little bit better Mm -hmm. about that, you know? And, um, and a lot of Ohio people are like, well, it's done. It's time to move on. We have to till the field, you know, or or go to the mill. now. (laughs) Like that's their, that's like, like you work in corporate. What are you talking about? Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah, that, yeah that's oh my god. You have you, you work from home, dog. <laughs> like, and and so you know it's just this kind of traditional thing. But it's like you know we live in a time. I know it's super crazy in America right now, but like 
we have so much information that's available to us and like we have such like a state of conscious being that like i don't the very few people like have like this kind of laborious old sort of like <laughs> way of living now and we all have like a kind of patent understanding or have the capability to to, to empathize and understand what other people think now mm-hmm. and so to like have a consistent lack of empathy i'm like I started to question other people at that point. I'm like, mm-hmm. you must be like a sociopath. <laughs> <laughs> like if you can't like empathize to some degree that somebody's sad about the passing of like a, an innocent creature, like right. <laughs> what's wrong with you, man? <laughs> you know? Yes. So what like took, cause you see, I, you talked about having couples therapy, which is so interesting. Like mm-hmm. I'd love to hear about your experience with that, yeah. but like what took you from being a stoic, non-emotional to being able to feel your emotions more? Um, You know, it's vacillated wildly throughout my life, but like Mm -hmm. I was a very emotional young person and then I went through the military and I mean, I was emotional during that, but you have to learn a discipline, you know, to, to keep it in. Mm -hmm. Um, And then, you know, having, I lost a lot of people young Mm. as well, or in my early twenties, you know, and, um, and I was also like had a lot of abandonment stuff. I grew up kind of alone. My mom was a single mom. Mm-hmm. I was a latchkey child, you know, Gen X, um, where, you know, I had a key to the house at like eight years <laughs> old and like had to, you know, take care of myself sort of thing. So you kind of learn to like either compartmentalize or deflect. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And then I would say my wife, um, she works within special education, mm. uh, clearly. And, um, to be able to deal with me and like she's helped me out she's helped me out a lot with that you know of like being like identifying like you know you're uh, i would assign a lot of my emotions as anger and she would be like it's actually probably you know insecurity or Mm. you're really sad and you don't know how to you don't know how to address it other than lifting weights, you idiot. <laughs> <laughs> or like, you know, going outside and like punching a tree. <laughs> you know? And and she's and she's right. I mean, to you know, and so oh. like for me to be able to like kind of express myself in a more consistent and like uh, responsible and adult manner is due in large part to her. That's awesome. Mm-hmm. Yeah, That's she's beautiful. got her moments too. I don't want to paint her as an angel here. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I, we it's a it's a gig and gig. it's a give and take, you know. Of course, <laughs> but but yeah, we help each other out, and like that's why you know I told her like through this whole process, like we we <laughs> thought this would maybe drive us apart because at mm-hmm. times like we we when we haven't been getting along, like the dog is what we would come back to, mm-hmm. you know, in terms of like we care for her, she's our objective, us outside of like you know our marriage. And it's actually brought us kind of closer together. And I told her like through this, like there are times I I love you more than I ever have, you know? And, and, um, you know, she's reluctantly said the same, (laughs) (laughs) but, um, yeah, so it's, I I would say it's due to that for sure to having that trust Mm -hmm. in her. Cause I didn't always have that in anybody. Mm -hmm. And so that's the thing that kind of keeps us together. Cause we don't always agree. And, and I think it's a thing that people don't understand is that, like, I have friends from the outside looking in. They're like, you know, you and your wife, like, sometimes you don't really necessarily agree on everything. And I'm like, well, I don't want, like, a Stepford wife. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> you know, and she doesn't want somebody who's going to do that as well. You know, she wants somebody who has their own opinions and their mm-hmm. own critical thinking and can offer their own uh, experiences to a conversation. So, like, you know, we value our, each other through that and. The, the main underlying thing is the trust, though. Mm-hmm. So I trust her more than anybody. Mm-hmm. And uh, that's what's really kind of gotten us through it. That is so real. I was just listening to a podcast with Orna, Dr. Orna. She does the um, couples therapy reality show. Have you guys heard of that? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> she want my It's on Showtime, I think. Or yeah. Something. Yeah. Uh, yeah. <laughs> only well, <laughs> only because only because like i got an, i got an email forwarded from uh my agent being like do you want to do this and I'm like, shut up yeah and, and she and my wife was like we should and i'm like no we shouldn't oh man why no. not 
I do not want my <laughs> issues out there broadcast to that degree. Like they get pretty, they get into very like tense stuff, and like I don't want any Showtime subscribers to be like, "Yeah, Derek sucks in bed sometimes," <laughs> you know, something like that. They're paying nine ninety nine a month to be like, "Ah, this four play game's pretty weak." You know? <laughs> like, Come up to you after a show and be like, "I've seen you before." Man. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Unfortunately, you have. Yeah, <laughs> dude, that's really interesting though, because mm-hmm. I' a big fan of that show. Yeah, you've mentioned it. Yeah, mm-hmm. but yeah, she was saying, things. she was saying in the podcast how someone asked her like, why does couples therapy still have this like huge stigma? And she's like, couples aren't allowed to. There's like this perfection thing that you have to be like, we don't mm-hmm. argue, we get along all the time. So like, mm-hmm. to think that you would need help at all is like stigmatized yeah right yeah my my mother-in-law calls us the bickersons Um, (laughs) and it's like sure but i don't know we know perfect looking couples who are (laughs) not so perfect behind closed doors right you know and uh, (laughs) that veneer that a lot of people put on i respect it because i mean like I respect people's ability to do that and they want to, you know, present a united front. I don't disrespect that. I don't want to say that there's always something going on. I have Mm -hmm. friends who are very happy marriages and they present as such. Um, But, you know, to say that other couples, you know, if they have like (laughs) troubles or they don't get along all the time means that they're like in a bad relationship or something Mm -hmm. like that is kind of short sighted thinking. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, we, 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 we are who we are flaws and all, Mm -hmm. you know, how long have y'all been doing couples therapy? Mm, Maybe seven, eight months now. Oh, okay. It's new. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's relatively, it's helped us out a lot. And, um, was it helpful to the, to your kind of grieving the loss of a a child, you know, your version of what that, that is for y'all. Um, did that, did therapy help support that? Yeah. Yeah, for sure. Mm -hmm. Um, I mean, uh, I, we have a very broken system um, for health insurance and whatnot that we're mm-hmm. a part of. Um, I think it's only kind of gotten worse and finding individual care has been difficult for me. Um, but she would like to see me go into individual like therapy, but the, at least like us, t- like talking about our dynamic and like, you know, kind of doing like a trade off, uh, you know, between talking about each other's respective issues with our counselor has been like very helpful, mm. you know? And, yeah. And it's also, it's like a preventative measure because, you know, for a while I was like really, really pretty unhappy. Mm-hmm. And it was going to be a situation where, like, you know, my wife day to day up until this, you know, up until our, you know, most recent incident here. It's generally like pretty happy go lucky. I feel like day to day, you know, and, and I, I'm like kind of big picture happy at times. And then she's, we're like opposites in that regard. And she's like day to day happy and I'm more like big picture. And then, but then it kind of trades off. But there was a time where I was like pretty irritable to deal with every day. And it's like, I don't want to put her through that. And if we don't address this as a Mm -hmm. unit, then like there's the potential that We won't be a unit anymore. Mm -hmm. And so rather than risk that, I'd rather suck it up and go through, you know, counseling, (laughs) you know, so. What was going on with the individual sadness? Yeah. Uh, You know, um, I had like a, I feel like I've dedicated a lot of time, energy and effort into the pursuit of like what it is that I want to do. And, Mm -hmm. Uh, the nature of art and entertainment and commerce has changed drastically so much that at times it just gets to be like, have I wasted, mm. you know, 12 years, 12 plus years now, like pursuing a thing that might not come into fruition? Like, should I have been, I don't know, thinking about a retirement or <laughs> saving any money whatsoever <laughs> or making any money or just like a lot of things that you that are like that are very real and germane to the material world, you know? And while I'm like at times, um, satisfied as a, as an artist Mm -hmm. or comedian, what's um, that you are. Yeah. I know. I know. It's just like kind of the silly label sometimes for me, but, uh, but, um, why does that feel silly? Um, 
<laughs> you know, when you're on stage telling a dick joke, <laughs> how much... <laughs> It's How much art artistic. is really going into this? <laughs> yeah, but you're telling dick jokes that get booked and, you know, that make you a living. So I, you are an artist. Some, I mean, there's a lot of dick jokes, but not all of them are. Yeah, yeah. exactly, Darcy. Thank you, Darcy. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, no, you're, you're right. And well, also, too, it's like I, I, got, I became singularly focused within the business and like I stopped branching out as much as I used to do and like. And since we've been going through this process, I've been like kind of branching back out into like doing things that like aren't necessarily exclusively comedic, but they are also artistic, you know, oh, like what uh, writing more, you know, and I, I really like essayists. I'm a big fan of like Raymond Carver and like old school Hemingway and Orwell and stuff like that. So I just started writing more again and um, I act as well. I started leaning into that sort of thing a little bit more rather than just chasing like just like just being on stage or. So you're a comedian, you like to write, and you like to act, but you're not an artist. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) Well, when you look at it that way. It's the only way to look at it. Mm -hmm. Well, one thing I've noticed just in, like, conversations with comedians, but I think it can, any kind of career building you're doing is the your perception is that you like you haven't made it mm. yeah but it's when you look at your you're doing it like you are a comedian right and you are these things and i think it's just our human nature sometimes to like have this thing up here but when you get there there's the next thing you know mm-hmm. and it's i don't know i just see that as like a a commonality. Yeah, you're always kind of like. grasping for the next ring sort of mm-hmm. thing. I have, you know, some successful, some pretty successful friends, and they're like, well, I'm not doing what this guy's doing. Right. Mm-hmm. I heard this, like, thing. I don't know if it's true or not. Um, I have a friend of mine who worked uh, for uh, Will Smith, and, like, <laughs> I guess Will Smith, like, spends a lot of time just looking at The Rock's Instagram. Because <laughs> 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 he's like... Damn, man, the... I'm going to cry. Well, because, like, he's <laughs> not The Rock. <laughs> and it's like, but you're still Will Smith, dude. You know? I don't know if that's true. Will Smith, if you're listening, I'm not trying to create unsubstantiated <laughs> rumors about you, my friend. <laughs> but, like, it, it, that's just what I heard. I don't know if it's accurate or not. But it is, like, you have to learn to be, like, kind of happy with where you're at. Mm-hmm. You know? My wife does remind me. She's like, you know... Five years, like, I was, I, was getting, I was talking about all the driving I have to do this summer. And she's like, you know, like, four summers ago, you would have been grateful to have mm. this. And, mm-hmm. like, you know. <laughs> I she's like your wife. Like, yeah. yeah. Yeah, yeah, she's great. Cool. Um, but she'll be like, um, you know, <laughs> she's like, you went from complaining about, like, going up late in the open mic to, like, you're not getting enough for a <laughs> shoot. <laughs> like, maybe, like. <laughs> Maybe like you know, <laughs> chill out, you idiot. Like you're doing fine. Do, do you have those same conversations with her in her high stress job? Yeah, uh, yeah, I do actually mm-hmm. because I don't know her. Her the nature of her job is really different. She used to teach in in a very rough part of Brooklyn, Bed Stuy, Brooklyn, and um, and she had a lot of really positive impact on those students and stuff like that. And then she's gone on to these other institutions that have been highfalutin, you know, mm-hmm. in terms of like their branding and everything like that. But like, it's like you're upscaling your career. You're at a place where you didn't necessarily think that you would be at. We got to look at like, be grateful for what we have sort of thing. Mm-hmm. And she is, but she just, you know, she has her career objectives and she wants to meet them mm-hmm. and she's working really hard at it. And so, but it gets daunting. You know? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, cause she's, she's like so dedicated to making sure that like her students learn, you mm-hmm. know, and, and it, it's, it's hard to deal with kids. Yeah. As one person. <laughs> yeah. as Yeah. Yeah. And dealing with like teenagers who, you know, they know everything mm-hmm. sort of mm-hmm. thing. And like, they're not going to necessarily listen to you, <laughs> you know, and, and it gets really tough, but I mean, you know, for the most part, she's, she's pretty self assured in it, but, um, you know, politics play a part in everybody's job. You know, and mm-hmm. she's got to deal a lot with that, mm-hmm. you know, but she's, she does a really good job of managing it though. So what got you out of, you were, we kind of winded a little bit. Well, what got you out of that, um, funk? Yeah. Oh, that and, you were and, in? um, 
mainly marriage counseling. Oh, nice. Yeah. I mean, like it, it, it was a gradual process where I, I would kind of stop and go, I am getting upset about nothing. <laughs> you know, and and we'll reference like, oh, yeah, the counselor said this. Mm. And therefore, you know, hey, as a reminder, we've discussed this. We've discussed like why I feel this way. Think about it clinically, mm-hmm. you know, think about it logically. And sometimes it still bubbles up. Sometimes it still is like, but I feel like I've kind of like learned to deal with it better. Yeah, yeah. totally. Sometimes yeah. I get self-conscious about how many times I say, well, my therapist says. So sometimes I lie and I'm like a friend of mine. Because <laughs> I say my therapist way too much. I should probably start saying that because I say it all the time. And like I'm like, yeah, I'm a therapist. So. I should be like, well, you know, my buddy told me. Well, I, as a therapist, I like to offer that if it resonated with you, it's your thought now. You don't Aww. have to say my therapist. That's Just nice. say you because it's it's your thought. Man, I feel you guys. <laughs> you guys. You guys. <laughs> I've, therapists are so, I don't know the word, like um, not eager, uh, adamant about being like, this is you that's doing this. Mm-hmm. Right. I would hope so, because I don't want the therapist to be like, your problems, I solve them. <laughs> Trust me, there's therapists like that. Oh, I believe it. Yeah, there's egoists. It like yeah. feeds their ego to yeah. think they... I mean, every therapist is going to really love and appreciate feedback that they were being helpful or something. Your work together has been helpful. Um, you just coming back to therapy does that, I think, mm. for most therapists. It's like they keep coming. Um, yeah. But yeah, it is important to to always give that back. To the client. That's nice. Mm-hmm. Right, right. Would you consider uh, to be a successful therapist somebody like you have a client and then they don't, or a patient, they don't need to be your patient anymore? Because like they've kind of, I don't know if they'd say figured it out is the mm-hmm. operative term, but like. Yeah, I'll tell people my goal is for you to fire me as quickly as possible. Mm-hmm. Oh, okay. I mean, that's a healthy way of looking at it. Yeah, because the, and the goal is not, i say the goal is not that I fix all your problems or all your problems solved before you leave, but I want you to understand your past mm-hmm. and how it's affecting you. And I want you to have the tools to manage the rest of your life because right. life will keep happening. And so it, my goal is just to help you manage your life. That's in what, a way that feels good for you. That's great because that's what like, our counselor comes at it from a perspective yeah. of like these are the traumas you experienced like as a as a youth, you mm. know, and like it's important for you to recognize that your issues now are rooted in that, mm-hmm. you yeah. know. So, um, yeah, which is accurate because when I look at back at like my upbringing or whatever, I'm like, oh yeah, that is what made me this way <laughs> yeah. isn't it all it's wild how it's always the childhood yeah what, what is it um some <laughs> I, I was reading some related study that was like the first like five six years of your life just determine the rest of it you know yeah your uh, attachment style is determined in the first 10 months mm-hmm. and i mean you can healing you can change your attachment style but yeah the first those really formative years are kind of setting the stage all your um <laughs> defun- <laughs> ding, ding, ding. <laughs> um, the, it's called the default mode network is getting okay. created like the first five to six years right yeah um, so you're kind of learning like when the doorbell rings someone goes and gets it you, that's like a, a default that gets put in there like when this happens then this is what it means and so because yeah. you have no frame of reference so you're building all of that framework to right. then like but it's setting and ro- wiring a lot of things that in therapy we try to rewire right yeah that, that's where a lot of my like um trust and responsibility issues i think came mm-hmm. from was because um my dad was like not a great guy and he mm-hmm. like was pretty much abandoned me and my mom or we just cut him out she made the conscious decision to cut him out because he was like not a positive influence and when he did come around it sucked and then (laughs) most of the time he didn't and then some of the times you would want him to he wouldn't and then you know and he wouldn't take very good responsibility about his actions or his role in it Mm -hmm. and um you know and so that's what i think led to a lot of like trust issues for a long time and like Mm -hmm. why i was like didn't have an ability to open up to other people for a long time. And then it took some trials and tribulations of going through it, of 
with other people, um, mm-hmm. you know, sometimes failing, but then you get to a point where you're like, I'm pretty comfortable talking about this or talking about myself or sharing myself. And then mm-hmm. that allows for some growth. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. yeah. That all gets wired. It's like your, your core needs of like the need to, to trust. And it's like, it's all getting, it's like setting the stage for how you're going to then go out to the world and experience it. So mm-hmm. if you weren't getting needs met or you had what you're learning about trust and security and safety and emotions, were they okay or not? Do you keep it like, how do you manage and work with those? Or do you just shove them down? Or are you small? So others around you are big. Like there's so many patterns of relationship even that, and just mindsets and ways that we think about things just gets, you know, I've heard like, yeah, they told me to just rub some dirt on it. Like when it, mm-hmm. something happened, right. you know, yeah. and they have these like, it's just like these programmed responses to things of how they deal with it. We don't realize we're operating on those um, yeah. or that we can change them. Right. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, I saw a therapist all throughout my childhood mm. and, um, you know, um, they kind of helped out with that. There was a, a guy I saw actually when I was like, just right out of high school, it was really pretty effective. Mm-hmm. Um, and that helped out a lot. Um, and then it's been kind of like in and out over the years, um, with, in terms of like, and I, and I think cause like, I do have some friends who are like, I'd never go see a therapist or whatever. <laughs> and it's like, well, you probably should. <laughs> <laughs> even most people that say that probably. Yeah, yeah. I mean, even just to like, like you know, I know some fairly successful people who are pretty grouchy Mm -hmm. and pretty upset, and they don't talk to anybody about it. And it's like you should talk to somebody. Mm -hmm. There's like this week. It's weird. Like I tell people when you like say, "Are you in therapy?" People are like, "Okay," and I'm like, "No, I think everybody deserves it." I'm not saying you Mm -hmm. should. I'm saying that's you. It's like someone saying, "I've been sick for so long," and saying, "Do you have you seen the doctor?" Right. <laughs> right. Yeah. Like, yeah. Like, we separate it all for some reason. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Even if it's a thing where it's like, I mean, there, it, it's hard to find somebody that you can be com- legally <laughs> open with. <laughs> you know? Like, Wait, what? Is, say more about that. Well, just <laughs> can you say more about that? No, no, no. <laughs> not legally. <laughs> well, like, 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 like you can, you, I mean, as long as you're not like confessing to a murder or something, you can talk about. Actually, we can't say that either. Oh, really? really? Like, if I like what? confess to a murder to my therapist, I mean, I didn't. <laughs> but I'm just saying, like, if I, if, like, I didn't even know that. I mean, yeah, so, like, yeah, if you need to get something, like, off of your chest and you have nobody else that you really feel like you can talk about it with, like, and you have somebody who is, like, bound by the law to be a <laughs> confidant and yeah. to help you through it. And, like, it feels good just to say stuff sometimes. Yeah, mm-hmm. someone who's completely removed from your life. Right. Yeah, yeah even if they're not going to offer you, like, immediate resolution. Mm-hmm. Or immediate gratification. The gratification will come from you, you just saying it, getting it off of right. your chest. Yeah. My the day before I, I left to come here, my wife and I had a very um, kind of intense conversation, and she offered up like how she was feeling about it, and she said, "You know what? I feel much better now that I've said it." Mm-hmm. <laughs> and so I think if you don't have that type of relationship with somebody else, you can hire a professional, you know, to <laughs> to have it. Good you know. point. Well yeah. made. Yeah. So, um, Wait, just real quick about the murder thing. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> like you, you're not required Anything to tell breaks, the cops. No, we're only required to break confidentiality if you're going to be a harm to yourself or someone else. There's elderly abuse, or if it's court mandated Even if by it's a judge, past term harm to someone else. Um, if you told me about like that, you molested children in mm-hmm. the past. Um, there's statute of limitations. I'm not, I don't have to determine that, but if I would, my next question would be, is this person have access to children? And uh-huh. then I would need to notify someone because that is a potential harm. Wow. Okay. Right. If, yeah. if they're coming to me, telling me I did this and I have a problem like around, you know, I'm like, right. do you have access to that? You could cause harm. Then I would have a duty to warn. Okay. At that point. But if there's okay. like, uh, there's, I'm sorry. No, I, no, no, please. If there's like a, a murder <laughs> mystery, <laughs> I'm like right. in the news, like who killed this person? Yeah. And your patient's like, I did. And you're, and you've just solved a mystery, but you don't have to tell anybody. Unless I was court ordered by a judge. 
Mm. Wow, dude, that's mm. a good book. Wow, yeah. <laughs> that, so I've had somebody write tell me if I came some in significant here. crimes they've committed. It wasn't murder, but wow. some significant crimes. And Whoa. I'm like, let's talk about what led you to do that. Oh, you're so good. <laughs> that's crazy. I'd be like... <laughs> What, bitch? <laughs> well, inside you're kind of like, oh god. <laughs> okay, <laughs> take oh, this no. one step at a time. <laughs> that's wild. Somebody but sits that's... down and they're like, "Have you heard of Nicole Brown Simpson?" <laughs> <laughs> well, it's well, not my I've got role to judge. <laughs> it's not your role to judge. Yeah, and that's my role isn't to decide if anything legal for them. Mm. Does like your own sense of morality come into play? Okay. Yeah, of course. Yeah. Yeah. It would be hard for me. I commend you because it would be hard for me to be like, to avoid that. You know what I mean? Like I'm mm-hmm. judgmental about like what condiment you use. Like much less <laughs> like, <laughs> like what? So real. Well, I think it's important for therapists have to know their limits and like what, where they feel they could be useful. Like, um, and there's somewhere if like some therapists are, you know, they're like, I w- couldn't work with a, someone like a, an abuser mm-hmm. like an active or known abuser mm-hmm. um like i couldn't work with like someone that's molested children and wanting therapy for it um like that just m- my morality would get in the way yeah of course of not judging so if i felt like i couldn't be show up in an honest safe space with a person then i shouldn't yeah you couldn't be objective yeah my yeah. job is to try to be objective and when i feel like it's impossible like even when it just comes to things of like you know, when my dad died and I had a therapy or I had a client, uh, like almost identical situation. And I had to be like, let's talk about this and see if you think I would be a good fit for this. Mm-hmm. And let's take it one step at a time. So you just always have to be aware of your biases and where you maybe can't provide the best care because of those things. Wow. I know. Right. Yeah. That's intense. But it, just because I don't want to, like, I don't believe in, you know, if it was somebody who had something against gay people Mm -hmm. like i've heard therapists say well how do we work with that and it's like that the job is to not be biased there Um, that's being a good therapist yeah Yeah. Yeah. but then you also don't want to me if i was a a client i wouldn't want a therapist that had strong opinions like that (laughs) but (laughs) you can't just like because i don't want to or i don't like you like Mm -hmm. that's not appropriate either Mm -hmm. yeah it, it kind of seems like it falls under like i mean you are offering care you know, and like if somebody, you know, gets hit by a stray bullet, it doesn't matter what their political views are. You know, it's like you got to triage the bullet, mm-hmm. you know, then we could talk about why you're a bad person after the fact, <laughs> you know, or whatever your opinions might be. Yeah. You know? Wow. That's crazy. Do you get uh, people coming up after sets that and telling you wild shit? <laughs> Yeah. You love yeah. this question. Yeah. You ask some version of it. I love it. It's really, it, <laughs> it's, it's interesting. Because it happens a lot. <laughs> <laughs> we need to do an episode just on that. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It depends. It depends on like what I, I guess like what I've talked about in my set normally or whatever. I, I remember I did, um, I did the comedy catch in Chattanooga. Mm-hmm. Oh boy. Yeah. They yeah. got some stories. Yeah. 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 And I had a, a woman come up to me after the show and she was like, <laughs> I love my daughters, but (laughs) (laughs) I wish I never had them and I left this town. I'm like, whoa. (laughs) Do you want to buy a sticker? (laughs) Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'll give you $5 off this (laughs) t-shirt. Yeah, it's, yeah, I've never had anybody like confess anything crazy. Sometimes I don't really touch on being a veteran a lot in my comedy Mm because there's not, I haven't really necessarily found a lot of relatable humor to most audiences. It's not like anybody can really like kind of like match me on experience really. Mm -hmm. And that's not to be like pretentious about it. It's just like, I I just, I don't know. I I guess like that's just kind of my limitations at times. I try to be a little bit more universal, but Mm -hmm. if I have talked about, I've talked to like, I did a show in the city a couple of weeks ago and there were a bunch of Marines that were there and they're Mm -hmm. like, we talked afterwards and they, you know, had some pretty crazy stories, mm-hmm. you know, stuff like that. Nothing where anybody's like confessed to a murder or anything like that. <laughs> but, <laughs> but yeah, some wild stories for sure. Yeah. What, um, what got you into comedy? Um, I, I was always like, I think as part of being like growing up, like, uh, without my mom gave me as much attention as she possibly could being a single mom working second shift, mm-hmm. you know, a lot of times or third shift. Uh, 
Were you your only kid? Uh, yeah, I was the only child oh, wow. until I was 20. And then my, my mom and my stepdad had more kids. But oh, they, wow. they had already kicked me out. It wasn't like I was like... <laughs> It wasn't like I was like with them, you know. Like step brothers, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> no, I have, I have two brothers who are twenty years younger than me and um, already more successful. It's great. And I uh, don't believe that. No, I, I say that as a joke, but they're they're, they're just really smart. And they have really great jobs, and they're 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 not as cool as me, but uh, <laughs> but they're good kids. They're 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 good young adults, and I'm very proud of them. But yeah, I grew I grew up. Um, uh, only child, uh, latchkey child. And so to get attention or to, you know, deflect or whatever, it would be like having to refine a, a sense of humor, you know, mm -hmm. a lot of it was, it's very cringe to look back on it, like attention seeking mm -hmm. as a child, I was a class clown, but like would probably take it too far at times <laughs> as a kid. But the, as I got older and I started to chill out, people would be like, you should be a comedian, you know, or mm -hmm. whatever. And I never took it seriously because I was like, I, growing up where I did, there there was no path to the arts mm -hmm. necessarily. Like most kids just either went to college or to the factory or the military. There was nobody I knew like became an actor. Yeah. You know, mm -hmm. like the rich kids did because like their parents could afford to send them away to acting school or whatever. But, you know, we didn't have those options mm -hmm. and so um it wasn't until so that's why i joined the military to get out of ohio mm -hmm. i just knew like yeah i was going to i put myself through college at a certain point i was working but i was like oh, at the end of this i'm still gonna be in ohio so <laughs> i'm just gonna get up and get out of here and uh <clears throat> and then during the military i would like i was on it was in the navy We'd be out at sea for months at a time, you know, and people would just come down to my workspace and be like, and tell me some stories Aww. or like do an impression for me or whatever, <laughs> you know, or like, oh. and I was really good at like roasting people in boot camp or like <laughs> making fun of people or whatever. And after a while, and then I got out and, um, I moved to Charleston, South Carolina, which is, you know, this beautiful place. Mm -hmm. And they had an improv theater. Like the week, the week I like moved there and I decided to like try comedy out, like the, the club closed. <laughs> so it was like <laughs> the, the comedy club closed. Like, Fuck. yeah. So like improv was kind of the only thing okay. that was there. And so I started doing comedy in that capacity and, um, I met, uh, Dusty. So oh I, yeah he and i we he he had been he's from there he's not from there he's from alabama but he lived in charleston okay um and we met doing a variety show and he was doing stand-up and i was in a sketch <laughs> and i didn't know anybody who was doing stand-up we didn't have any stand-up and he didn't oh he wasn't really doing it then either he had been just kind of living on the beach being a bum <laughs> and we just we just hit it off instantly <laughs> And we became pretty quick friends, and then we decided to start, like, an open mic. He was more of, like, the the can-do person behind it, and um, but we were all, like, in a pretty supportive um, ecosystem, and, you know, we just started doing it in that capacity, and then um, it got to a point where, like, there's only so much of a, there's a ceiling to a town like that, right? Mm -hmm. you know, and <clears throat> I moved up to New York, and he moved here, and, and uh, we just tried to scale upwards from there you know but the root of it always was like this is like the only thing that people ever told me like oh you're really consistently pretty funny you should look into it and when you were in the navy were you like oh i'm gonna try comedy when i get out of here i thought yeah i well i don't know i i had such a penchant my dad was like such like a um a, a loser mm -hmm. that i wanted to like my driving nature was like i can't be like him i gotta be a guy who has like i wanted to be a guy who had like a suit and tie job consistently working and was like a good role model for my brothers mm -hmm. and then i became that and then i was like they were like well we don't care <laughs> <laughs> i mean they, they cared but they were like they have their own father um and they had their own interest and like i achieved that objective and also i found that like corporate america middle management like unless you're part of like an upper class that comes from like a legacy mm -hmm. sort of like uh 
you know, inheritance class of people, you're not necessarily going to scale up to the degree that you really want to. And so I was like, well, if I'm just going to get screwed in life, I might as well be enjoy it, <laughs> you know? And so I entered show business, <laughs> you know? <laughs> so, <laughs> so I, I, I quit my job and moved to New York and it's been, <laughs> It's been all uphill since. <laughs> I have a, a question. Um, mm-hmm. Do you do you like this? Do you like comedy? <laughs> <laughs> I, you know, I, I love. Well, here's the thing: is like, I, I get that question a lot, and um, I love performing. I love performing. I love audiences. I love hanging out with other comics. The thing I do not enjoy is uh, uh, the business aspect of it. I, I mean, in terms of like of of how it's kind of handled and the opportunities and whatnot but part of that was a me thing i saw i I saw there's a therapist in new york who sees like all the comedians i Mm. guess (laughs) and i talked to him uh for oh that's you yeah she's the natural one of those okay (laughs) all right well i met your new york counterpart (laughs) and i only had one session with him um because my insurance didn't cover it but he was he he quickly was like, "Oh, you grew up as an only child," like immediately off the bat. He was <laughs> oh, like, damn. "He was like, you never had any siblings that you had to compete with, and so you never figured out how to properly kind of navigate things." And so I guess like the, like sounding like I do is more of like my internal resentment towards myself about not figuring out this like how to navigate things. I'm much better at it now. Mm-hmm. I think the the thing that makes me sound the way I do is like it's been <laughs> so much time of me just figuring me out that I get like really fatigued by it. Mm-hmm. But I love comedy. I love traveling. I'm I'm excited to do all the shows that I'm on. I'm excited to be at the club tonight and like and um and to perform for people. I yeah, I'm getting to a point where people are starting to come out to shows because they follow me online or whatever mm-hmm. and and it's 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 a lot of fun. So I enjoy that aspect for sure. It's just kind of like at a certain point you're like, when does this get to be like consistently sort of agreeable or consistently sort of like rewarding? It's very ups and downs. Yeah, mm-hmm. man. At times. So you experienced that too? Yeah. Like up and down? Yeah, there's some mm-hmm. hard, hard parts of it. Mm-hmm. I I don't know if it ever is just like this is so easy. Like butter. Yeah. You know? Yeah. I don't know if that'll ever. Yeah. I don't know if it's ever going to happen. I, 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 rem- I have to constantly remind myself, like, I love the process of doing this. <sighs> yeah. You know? Yeah. And if you're not like, if you're like, I, I guess the thing is too, is, is for me is, is that I've always wanted to have a result to show to other people mm-hmm. to, for like that external validation. I always needed an external validation from other people the attention seeking, you mm-hmm. know, that sort of thing. And so I've always been like uh, wanting like, Oh, Hey, I'm in this show, like this TV show, or mm-hmm. I've done this TV show, or I've done this movie or whatever the case may be mm-hmm. to be like, this is, I'm valid right, with my choices and whatnot. But I've had to remind myself, like you can't be result oriented when like you don't always determine the results. Mm-hmm. Like we don't, you don't have a say in like, I, you have some, only so much of a say in how your career is going to progress. Mm-hmm. I mean, I, I, I think if you keep working, keep progressing, it's going to work out great. But like, you know, um, you never know. Yeah. Yeah. And I that's think daunting we, to deal with. Yeah. And yeah. we get presented with that every single time we do a show because people will be like, how do you want me to bring you up? Mm-hmm. <laughs> What's your credits? And you're just like. Just say just my name. Say my name. <laughs> say my name. Just say yeah. I'm funny, bro. Just bring me up. You know. Yeah, I, I, there. I just <laughs> did a show recently, and this guy, the host, came up to me and he showed me his phone, and it was like a, a paragraph note, and he's like, "This is your intro." I was like, "Man, dude, just say I'm a funny guy." Because <laughs> <laughs> like the funny. audience really doesn't care. They don't. They, they. I, I've always said this about comedy. They should say your credits after you do your set, <laughs> <laughs> because like. I was I was back home. I was in Charleston, and I've been i been I, part of the reason I went to Charleston was like write to have some free space to write. Mm. I've been doing the same act for a while. I refined it and I put it on an album, and now I'm ready to like try and do more. 
and expand my, you know, change up my style a little bit, kind of challenge myself in new ways, Fun. you know. And I was doing the open mic at the club in Charleston. And the guy who hosted it's old buddy of mine. And like, there's like four people in the audience, you know, and he's <laughs> like, man, this next guy coming up. He's a headliner mm-hmm. popping off from New York City. Everybody, you are in for a treat. <laughs> I'm like, I've got five new minutes about grocery shopping, man. Like, like, don't build this up bigger than it's supposed to be, man. I'm just trying to tell these jokes. <laughs> and so, yeah, you're like, you're, you're like. I, I, I really am happy. I, like, I, I didn't correct him or anything. I didn't tell him. I didn't get mad or tell him after the yeah. fact, like, you shouldn't say that. It's like, I, I, I told him, I was like, I really thank you for saying that because it means that you respect me. Mm-hmm. And, like, I, I do appreciate that a lot. Mm-hmm. So I, I try not to be, like, you know, picky or whatever. But it's like, you know, if the set goes well, I'll, not, I'll tell him where you can find me. <laughs> and if it doesn't, be like, well, that was his first time trying. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. That's smart. <laughs> this may be my uh, uh, default optimism that mm-hmm. I feel like I have, but I I think that obviously it's just about perspective. All these little things that aren't perfect, like not selling out a show or whatever, things aren't going the way you want. At the end, toward you know when you're eighty or you've been doing it for like sixty years or whatever, you're gonna be like that was all part of the mm-hmm. like you're gonna be proud yeah. of mm-hmm. all of that. Yeah, it was all yeah. part of the the journey of your life, mm-hmm. you know. I did a I did a, a show last night at um, at the lab at Zany's, oh, nice. and, and I thought it went just okay, and just because it was like kind of a it was a weird audience, and I'm glad that some of the other comics felt the same way because like you know it's a great room, but they're just still kind of figuring it out, right? And um, I was walking to my car around the side of Zany's. I, I missed out on the parking in the back. <laughs> and I was just getting ready to text my wife. I was like, well, at least I have commercial acting. <laughs> and, um, and then this car stopped and it was a car full of people. And they're like, yo, you were our favorite. Aww. You were the best. Like, and I had my little cards in my pocket that I hand out after shows. And I was like, you guys want to come see another show? I'm going to be there like. They're just like so excited to see me and like and everything. I was like, "Oh yeah, this is what like this this does make me happy." And I'm like really happy to do mm-hmm. this. And I was happy doing the show. I'm, mm-hmm. I was happy to hang out with the comics. All the comics in Nashville have been really super cool. And like, and um and so I'm like you know just happy in general. But that just like oh yeah, I am doing fine. You know, right. I'm doing great. You know, <laughs> that I think Chris Rock said at one point where he was like sometimes you'll bomb and the audience won't know. Like you'll get to a point where like you, yeah. but the, and I feel like those are the shows you're like, Oh, that was rough where everybody's like, that was so amazing. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Like, yeah. yeah. I'd almost rather bomb. So at least there's like a, a, a definitive nature, you know, rather than the ambiguity of like, I think I was okay. <laughs> You know, but I think also too the way I sound about it because now I'm like obsessed with how I sound about it. But like, <laughs> where where I come from, you're not supposed to be like proud. Like you're mm. not supposed to have like a pride about yourself because like you know it's hubris. But it's like you know, I mean, it's taken me a long time to feel proud of myself, and so I you know especially like you know some of the people that have made it who've come out of where I come from, you know, not that it was necessarily eight mile or anything, but it was like, it was, <laughs> it was difficult and they they have successful careers and they're really happy people and, and stuff like that. And it's like, uh, you know, I, I, I just want to, um, you know, I don't want to, I, I, I try to be humble about how great I am. <laughs> mm-hmm. I feel like a lot of comedians do that. Yeah. yeah. I've yeah. heard you say that a lot. Mm-hmm. I'm curious if you still like you, you mentioned that you use comedy as like a way to, have this external validation mm-hmm. does it still operate that way for you or do you feel like you have you are where you can feel validated just internally with yourself um good question <laughs> um i i do feel that well i guess i guess i'm kind of like i just like it um in terms <laughs> of like performing and stuff like that I, I don't need the to validate myself as a person i do not need comedy um good but i do enjoy it so i do like to know that like i'm good at it you know like you're um, human (laughs) yeah 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 Yeah, exactly yeah yeah i I, there are other ways that to you know i 
to validate yourself as a person. Um, and I mm-hmm. found those and, and, um, you know, and just, I mean, I'll, I'll say, I know it sounds like kind of corny, but like even just being in a, like a consistent and strong marriage is validating, mm-hmm. um, and being a good partner and stuff like that and being mm-hmm. a good friend of my friends and, mm-hmm. you know, a, a, a good member of my family or, you know, is, is pretty validating. Mm-hmm. Um, I don't need the external validation to, to tell me I'm a good person, but yeah. you know, I, I do enjoy being creative and I like yeah. having that creative muscle rewarded. Yeah, mm-hmm. yeah, absolutely. Yeah. That makes a lot of sense. Yeah. So in that capacity for sure. But, yeah. um, you know, I, I say that and then tomorrow I'll probably have a breakdown. <laughs> <laughs> That's okay. Yeah. <laughs> um, uh, do you have any other questions? No, I think oh. that's it. That that one was sticking in my brain, so I wanted to go oh. back to it. <laughs> okay. You're so wonderful. I love your mm-hmm. energy, man. It's just like I feel you give peace. Oh, thank you. Yeah. It's been a long time coming. <laughs> yeah, thank you. I know this has been a lot of fun. I appreciate it. I was probably a lot more open than I thought I was going to be, to oh, be frank yeah. with you. It was yeah. wonderful. Yeah. Yeah. yeah I can tell you've done some work. You're like aware of yourself. Uh, thank you. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Mm-hmm. You know, it is, um, I, I think a lot of people don't give themselves enough grace in life yes. to kind of fail, you mm-hmm. know? And, um, I, I was that way with myself a long time and it, I guess I'm kind of proof that even at, I'm, you know, I'm 45, um, and even you can still continue to learn and, and grow and, and, find the internal validation or self-sufficiency that you kind of need even at an older mm-hmm. age, you know, cause oh, I think I some, that. yeah, I think some people mm-hmm. like, you know, if you look at things objectively, uh, or, or just, I guess based on some other's subjective opinion, you could say, well, you're this age, you don't have this going for you. That's traditional. What are you going to do with yourself? And it's like, well, I'm happy with who I am. So mm-hmm. maybe don't worry about it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. There's so many people that have gotten the success they're looking for and they're not happy with themselves. Right. Mm-hmm. Yeah. That, that's that constant. Like chase. you were talking about grouchy yeah. people. Yeah. That you know. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. I that reminds me, I want to say real quick, I've been listening to Julia Louis Dreyfus. She has a podcast where she talks to older women mm-hmm. um called Wiser Than Me. It's so good. Mm-hmm. But uh it's, <laughs> but every time she asks them, they're like in their 70s, 80s. And every time mm-hmm. she asks them, how old do you feel? They're like, oh, 50. And I'm like, wow, that to yeah. them is young. Like mm-hmm. there's, and I, you know, you're, mm-hmm. they're like, oh man. Like, and it just gave me some perspective of like, life is long, you know? Yeah. <laughs> like. I feel young. I mean, like I, I feel 35. Yeah. And, you know, my, my wife and I are pretty active. I, and, um. And I have a lot of energy, um, all things considered. It probably doesn't sound like it right now. But, uh, <laughs> You're no, traveling I mean, all over, though. I mean, yeah, yeah, traveling all over and then, you know, and, and making my commitments to my family and then also making my commitments to, to me. Um, you know, it requires a lot of energy and effort. And uh, I still feel pretty young, pretty excited about life still. You know, Good. in spite I love of everything. That. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you for coming on here, dude. I, oh, I really yeah. appreciate it, Derek. Thanks so Thank much you. for having me. It's been a lot of fun. Yeah. Um, so uh just two last questions. One, mm-hmm. what do you like to do outside of comedy that just like really revs your engines? I <laughs> <laughs> um I like to I like to work out. Oh um, hell yeah. Yeah, I I we, I do a lot of kettlebells. Wow. Yeah. Um, I do that. I play basketball, you know, um, that's been a lot of fun. And I also, uh, I don't know if I, I, I watch a lot of movies, but like, and I don't do it in like a passive sense. Like I read, um, critical reviews and then I opine <laughs> on them on my own and like having, <laughs> wow. and ha- well, having that like sort of like internal dialogue and like internal reflection and about like what, like a piece of art might mean, um, you know, for me or for society writ large is like, I, I get pretty excited talking about that. You know, mm-hmm. I love ask that. my wife. She's like, Oh my God, another movie conversation. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. I like it too. It's awesome. Oh, uh, and then if you'd like to share where people can find you. Yeah. Oh, I'm on, um, Venmo. At, uh, <laughs> now I'm on all social media, uh, at hump Derek. Um, <laughs> Really? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, at Hump Derek, H-U-M-P-D-E-R-E-K. You, you hear it, right? 
Oh yeah. Okay. <laughs> oh yeah, of course. Yeah, You're like yeah. I planned that. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Well, that was it. Was weird when I just got. I used to have like a go through a lot of ads. Like for a while, it was Oprah Humphrey or like. <laughs> Because I was like, oh, somebody's looking up Oprah. They'll see me, too. Right. <laughs> They're like, yeah, that's the one. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah, this big, dumb idiot. That guy. Don't be mean to yourself. Uh, you're, I know. I'm kidding. You're talking about our friends. Yeah. <laughs> but, uh, um, yeah, but I was surprised to find out on all platforms that Hump Derek was still available. <laughs> So, you know, Instagram, someone's going to have to be TikTok. Hump Derek one out there. I know. Yeah. <laughs> you got it. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, Hump Derek. Hump Derek. Hump Derek. Hump yeah. Derek. Okay. Awesome. Thanks thank you. For yeah, being well, thank here. you for having me. No, you yeah. guys are great. Thank you. It's a I lovely conversation. It. You really Absolutely. enjoyed it. Yeah. All right. Blessings. All right. Peace yeah. and blessings. Indeed. <laughs> Thank you for listening to I'm Fine, It's Fine podcast. My name is Amber Autry. I'm a comedian based here in Nashville and internationally touring. You can find me on all platforms at Amber Autry Comedy. And I am Melanie Reese. I'm a trauma therapist here in Nashville. You can find me across all platforms at Trauma Therapy Nashville. We really appreciate you listening so much. And if you want to give a little extra for free, make sure you're liking, subscribing, rating, reviewing, sharing with your friends, talking about it to literally everyone you see, because it helps so much. And we're so grateful for the extra effort. And if you like what you're hearing and you want some bonus material, that includes interviews with other practitioners and the, all the juicy stuff that Amber and I talk about that doesn't go into the normal podcast. Um, we'd love to have you subscribe. You can find the link in our bio and $5 a month. You can do it.